Morning. <laughs> so, um, I want to say that, um, uh, let's keep it up. Um, let's make sure we keep up the dialogue and, and, and let's remember why we're doing it so that we can just be more informed when we act. A big issue is dealing with each other so that we're more solidified as people who are invested into a movement. And one of the stumbling blocks for people in our nation, in the United States, has been race. And it's often been used as a way of dividing people, whether we uh, recognize it or not, to stop us seeking our economic interests. So it's a tried and true way of the wealthy to divide the poor, right? And to make sure that they're not together so that they can press for social change. So one of the things we really want to solve is ways of showing respect and regard for each other. So in order to show respect and regard, we need some understanding, right? We need some, some, some insight into the problems that happen. So hopefully in this talk about privilege, we'll not only hear what Jacenka has to say, but we'll have an opportunity to engage and maybe work out some problems. All right, so with that said, uh, oh, let me also promote, as I like to do, I want to just promote the next few uh, talks. So on Wednesday, I'm going to give a talk on a scholar named uh, Charles Mills, who's a really important uh, philosopher of race. Um, and he's also someone really interested in issues of class. And he had a very original way of talking about race and racism. And it's his notion of the racial contract. And in his book, he talks about how we can get beyond a certain level of races, racism and race problems by consciously acknowledging the contract and ripping it up. Uh, the next talk, uh, one week from today, will be um, Roxanne Amico. And she's going to address the environment. Uh, the title is Ecological Collapse. Time short, stakes high. All right, so please uh, uh, continue to come out. Um, we're going to have a full schedule for February events that's going to start being mailed out tonight. Um, thank you for your support. And today, please help me in welcoming Jacenka. And please, Jacenka, help me with your full name because I don't want to mispronounce your last name. That's okay. It's Jacenka Herstanovich. Herstanovich. Okay, you're from? Bazian. And uh, you're going to speak about Peggy McIntosh. Yes, unpacking, unpacking the invisible knapsack. Excellent. Yep. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you so much. I first want to salute you all for still being here. I wish I could be here, but my <coughs> circumstances don't allow it. You are here. I'd like to be, but today I'm very, very, very happy to be here with you and amongst conscious people. So, um, the reason I, um, I decided, I studied black studies in college, and the reason I did this is for the same reasons that Heron just mentioned with this division and, um, you know, to, to just understand. Okay, let me, uh, let me start by saying a little bit about my history. I'm from Bosnia, and um, my people were divided by religion. And um, the biggest genocide since Hitler's time took place in the 90s in my country, which is why I'm here. So we were all the same people, same language, same culture, but disagreement came with religion. So it was just a very, very sad situation. And from that, I just learned the biggest thing that I got out of it was pretty much that, you know, um, you, you, can't, you can't allow yourself to be divided from other human beings because that makes you weak. Solidarity is what is what is necessary for us to persevere and have a brighter future. And um, the, the term minority, I really, really abhor that word because when you add up all the people of color in the world, they're really the majority. So I just, um, I got involved with black studies in college and um, the reason I, I want to discuss this article on white privilege un unpacking the invisible <coughs> knapsack is because it was one of the first articles I read that made me aware of what's really going on out there. And um, I just, I would really love to have a dialogue on this topic because what do you have to do to fix something? You have to first figure out what's wrong. So I figured this is like a good first step. And I understand a lot of you have already read it. So that's amazing. We'll all be on the same page. And if not, I'll just um, point out some of the some of the things that mostly stood out to me in this article. So um, with that said, um, I would just like to talk a little bit about in institutionalized racism and um, well, pretty much just um, 
I guess, like I said, this will be the first step to just see what, um, as a white person, that um, we are perpetuating this and allowing the system to to be by just ignoring the benefits and privileges and ignoring them is just as bad as implementing what has been implemented against all the other people of color and such. So Peggy McIntosh, this article was written in 88, which is the year I was born, which is really disturbing because I'm like going to be 24 years old this month and this still applies. So some of the things um, that really stood out to me that she said in this um, in this article, some of the benefits of white privilege she, um, she mentioned as, if I should need to move, I can pretty sure of I can, sorry, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing a housing in an area which I can afford and in which I, I would want to live. I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. Um, I kind of grouped them together because she has like 50 points that she made and 26. then another one. Sorry? 26. <laughs> There's 50 in oh, this yeah? one. Yeah, oh. this is the full article. Oh. Yeah, um, I have no difficulty finding neighborhoods where people approve of our household. And I remember one of the um, books that I read in one of my classes said that once a neighborhood becomes to be 7% black, that's when white flight, white flight happens and just, that's 7%. And even, I mean, come on, even if it was more than that, but I'm just saying 7% is, it, I just, I don't know, I just don't understand. And I guess for rational people, this is hard to understand. Um, so, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. When I'm told about our, um, our national heritage or about civilization, I'm um, shown that people of my color made, made it what it is. And this, this is really disturbing to me because up until college, pretty much all that I learned about African American people in high school and up until high school was that, you know, their history starts with slavery in this country. And not so much. When you look back at ancient Egypt or Kemet, you see um, you see that these people had the first institutions, the first um, universities, and everything came from there. So it's just people have been robbed from um, pretty much robbed from their history. From yes, from Egypt, where they had the first universities and everything. Kemet. So. Um, Kemet's an old name from Egypt. It means land, the black, the land of the black uh, river, something like that. It refers to the uh, Nile being flooded and having rich black soup. Cairo, that area, there's nothing. And um, I've actually been to Egypt, and um, all the statues were missing their lips and their noses. So it's just a you know, cover up history. Why are they missing their lips and their noses? Because these people are Africans and just discredited. Allegedly, Alexander the Great was offended by that and cut off those features. The Allegedly. entire museum, I couldn't find a single statue that still had a nose <coughs> and their lips complete. Unbelievable. Um, another point she makes, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. Um, she, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware, but she is a, a Caucasian woman writing this article about the benefits. Um, I can speak, speak in public to a powerful male group without putting my race on trial. I can remain oblivious of the language and customs of pers persons of color who constitute the world's majority without feeling in my culture any penalty for such oblivion. Um, if a traffic cop pulls me over or if the IRS audits my tax return, I can be sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. I don't know if um, some of you might some of you might have read this book, but um, it was um, written by Tim Wise and it's um, White Like Me. He's also a white male who speaks about all the benefits, being pulled over with tinted windows in a predominantly black area, and the officer just saying, oh, okay, you're free to go, son. So, yeah, that's a very, very powerful book also, just to, to make us see things that maybe we don't see because we're benefiting from it, just like when there's preference given between siblings by the parents, the... the the kid that's favorite is not going to be like, Mom, you're not being fair. It's going to be the other kid that's going to say something. So just start by um, recognizing the privileges. That book is a great tool also. Um, I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race. 
if I declare there's a racial issue at hand, or there isn't a racial issue at hand, my race will lend me more credibility for either position than a person of color will have. I am not made acutely aware that my shape, bearing, or body odor will be taken as a reflection of my race. Um, I can take a job with affirmative action employer without having my coworkers on the job suspect that I got it because of my race. I can be late to a meeting without having the lateness reflect on my race. I can be sure that if I need legal or medical help, my race will not work against me. Um, there's a book also, Medical Apartheid. Do you know the author by chance? No, um, I do remember in Canada there were studies done that showed how there were these um, worse outcomes for people of color. Um, yeah. uh, that was in the 90s. To the, yeah, the, the, the study covered the early 90s to the first part of the second dec the 2000 decade. But uh, no, I don't know the author of that. Particular book. I'll look into it and I'll let you guys know. Amazing. <coughs> it just talks about all the experiments and the, the way that um, healthcare could get to where it is today and um, the, the people that they used for their experiments. Even back in the days of slavery, they, they wouldn't even use any anesthesia, any form of numbness, and they, numbing the, the patients, and they would just experiment on um, black people in this country. It's, <coughs> it's a very, very, very <coughs> um, tough book to read. Like but syphilis experiments. Right, yeah. Tuskegee, how do you say Tuskegee? Yeah, Tuskegee. Oh, yeah. Tuskegee, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, <clears throat> that for instance. That makes you wonder about AIDS in Africa today. Um, yes, so I'll just read a few more here, just to get to 50, since some of you only saw an article that came up to 26. Well, uh, uh, no, it was 26 in the body of the article, and then she has a list of 46 afterwards. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. I have, I think mine's a little different then, because my whole right into the 50, but that's okay. Um, I only have like two or three more, then we can just all talk about it. I just picked out like the ones that were just, that stood out to me the most. Um, if I have low credibility as a leader, I can be sure that my race is not the problem. I can choose blemish, cover, or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. I feel welcomed and normal in the, in the usual walks of public life, institutional and social. The whole notion that the concept of beauty is generated by the white culture, and so all all the all the black women cutting their hair and straightening it, and that being like a major expense for them uh, to look and value uh, 